Hello, this is the first in a series of videos talking about issues in the analysis of screening designs. And before watching this video, you should have read through the uh, notes screening designs part three. And in this video, we're going to discuss the challenges that we have in analyzing screening designs, particularly in the presence of partial aliasing. We'll talk about what's called effect sparsity and what we call the challenge of over and under fitting. Okay. So the analysis problem really comes about, so in talking about screening designs and analyzing them, what you'll see is that we are often <clears throat> faced with a lot of choices in terms of what particular models might bet best fit the data and traditional approaches such as hypothesis testing and p-values actually don't work well in these scenarios. So we need a different set of tools to help us. So basically what our goal is going to be is to build models that contain the terms that are most important to the prediction of the response. And up until now, we haven't formally talked a great deal about prediction, although in our experiments, um, such as the catapult um, experiments and the helicopters, our ultimate goal is prediction. And frankly, that is typically the goal in science and engineering applications of design of experiments. So going forward in a good part of the remainder of the semester, we're going to talk specifically about the issues of prediction. And when we talk about important terms, we mean important to prediction of the system that we're studying. Okay. Now, an important principle is something called effect sparsity. If you've had some background, for instance, in uh, industrial quality control, it's similar to what's known as the Pareto principle. That is basically, we may have a large candidate set of potential effects, but in reality, only a small number, maybe 20, as high as 40%, may actually be important. In fact, if effect sparsity didn't really hold, design of experiments would have little chance of succeeding in fact, uh, control of physical systems, such as engineers do, typically would not even be feasible. There simply would be far too many effects, effects which will all have a big impact on the response. So going forward, we're going to assume that effect sparsity holds in the systems we experiment on. And there is a good deal of literature to indicate this is a good assumption. And I point you to uh, chapter two of Hoos and Jones, where they do talk about effect sparsity. So at this point, we're going to assume we're looking for a subset of potential effects which have the biggest impact on the response. They are the most important. And when we talk about sparsity in screening designs, we have to think of it in a couple of ways. One is an absolute sense of sparsity in which typically, again, there's no exact number here, but 20%, 30 even 40% might actually be active. But when we do a small screening design, we think of sparsity in the sense that maybe up to 50% of potential effects could be significant. Once you get above that, we have to start thinking about augmenting the design, adding more runs to try to estimate more effects. Okay. And although sparsity, as I said, is a well-established principle, it really does not have any exact theoretical underpinnings. And there is some potential that something in complexity theory they call the center manifold reduction principle might apply. And all that principle really says is in any large dimensioned physical system, there is typically a subspace where most of the kinetics or action takes place. 
and the trick is to try to find that region and in a way that's what we're actually doing with design of experiments. Figuring out where the action is and figuring out through a model how to control the behavior of the system. Okay. So when we go through modeling there's a few principles and again these are not rules I would just call them guidelines that we take into account. Uh, number one, lower order effects tend to be more important than higher order effects although this again is just a principle and sometimes we get very large and important interactions. Heredity, if a higher order term is significant or important then the lower order terms tend to be important. Again, heredity is a principle. It is not a theorem. It is not a rule. Something that you should always keep in mind, and this goes back to George Box, whom we're going to talk about later on, who made a big change in how we think about experimental design, once said, all models are wrong, some are useful. And he meant just that. All models are approximations to the, a physical system and in that sense all models are naive but they may be useful. We'll define useful as having prediction capability. And of course subject matter expertise is eminent meaning in looking at these models and interpreting them you really need input from people who are experts in the physical system. They don't necessarily override all the analysis, but they usually have insights that are very helpful in building models and understanding them. And then finally, something we call parsimony, which simply means simpler models that perform as well as more complex models are preferred. Okay. So when we go to the actual practice of building models, there are two issues that go on and this, it, this pertains well beyond design of experiments. This is in building models period. We have underfitting. We don't have enough of the important terms and this usually results in biased or inaccurate prediction. The other is we have too many terms. We're putting terms in the model that really contribute very little or if, if anything to prediction. The problem is adding unnecessary terms to a model tends to inflate prediction error and in fact overfit enough you can actually produce nonsensical predictions um, for future data. So basically what we try to do is build models that give us a reasonable compromise between the two extremes. Remember this is not a simulation. This is a physical system. There really is no such thing as a true model. We're simply trying to find the best compromise between under and over fitting. Okay. So slide eight gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So if you go from left to right, what you'll see is as the model is getting bigger, okay, then any bias, looking on the left-hand axis, goes down. But as we add terms, the variance or the error in our prediction increases. So what we tend to look for in modeling is, in some sense, the sweet spot. Where do we have our best trade-off between bias and variance? And that's essentially what we're going to do in some of the uh, coming examples and sections in the course. How do we find in some way that set of models that are best in that they give us the best uh, compromise between bias and variance? We're always willing to make some small trade-offs in order to achieve uh, better models, models that predict well in practice. Okay. So essentially what we're looking for is a region to focus on where the models really do give us the best uh, compromise. If they're too small, again, you're in an underfit region and your models will be inaccurate. 
they'll systematically give wrong predictions and if we get too big we're in an overfit region where unfortunately your model may fit the data very well but you try to use it in practice say to predict process performance and it can give and I have seen this wild and crazy predictions and when I see that I know right away the people have overfit their model and there are too many extreme term <coughs> excuse me extreme terms basically overfitting is the point where you're fitting the noise in the data itself so when you get new data it's not going to have the same noise but your model still trying to predict a non-existent pattern in the data okay. so overfitting is indeed a very serious problem and in general I find people tend to overfit rather than underfit uh, underfitting is usually easy to see by looking at uh, actual by predicted plots in residual plots overfitting is tricky okay. so what we need are some criteria for which we can make decisions about models I'll say up front the statistic often taught uh, R squared or the coefficient of determination is actually rather useless for this task R squared and versions of it always lead to overfitting often significant overfitting but there are a couple of other statistics that most statisticians um, more or less coalesce around and they're called the Akaiki information criterion and the other is called the Bayesian information criterion these two statistics actually take into account under and overfitting and they punish overfitting but they do it in different ways as you'll see so they may not agree in general as to what are the preferred models and among statisticians there has never been any real agreement as to whether one might be preferred over the other in general uh, however if you look at the bottom of slide 10 uh, for both statistics smaller values indicate better predictive models okay so I won't get into the details the mathematical detail but on slide 11 you see the formula for the AIC statistic and the term on the right that you see 2p times p plus 1 over n minus p minus 2 where P is the number of terms in the model including the intercept and the estimated mean square error that you find in the ANOVA table so P uh, is the number of terms in the model plus an intercept plus an estimate of the error okay. so that second term punishes overfitting the first term on the right hand side punishes underfitting and I won't get into the exact details uh, the AIC is based upon some rather difficult to, to follow theory from what we call information theory which actually has its roots in thermodynamics again we don't need to get into that to use these statistics and generally you'll see um, as we go through the course what I'm going to do um, and you'll have and I'll show you how to do this Let me grab a pointer here and that is what we'll actually work with we go. Okay. is on uh, slide 12 in the middle it's called the Delta statistic for a set of models we go through all the models we pick the one with the smallest AIC in theory that's the best model but remember that's in theory and there is typically a lot of uncertainty about which model is best so what we typically do is calculate this Delta the difference of every other model back to the smallest large values of Delta indicate that that particular model really should not be considered it's inferior to the smallest AIC model 
Similarly, the BIC works the same way. Notice on the right-hand side, the overfitting penalty is different. That's why these two statistics, especially in small data, will not agree. And then finally, in using this statistic, we will also use a delta version. I call it capital B sub I. And large values of B sub I, again, indicate models that are inferior to the model with the smallest BIC, and we would not consider them further. Okay. And finally, in looking at models, we consider the residuals, just the difference between the actual and the predicted. And if our model fits well, the residuals are random noise, scatter. If we underfit and we have bias, you'll typically see a pattern in those residuals. Okay. And again, you can get residual plots in jump in the fit model dialog window. Uh, under the uh, main report menu, go to Road Diagnostics, Plot Residual by Predicted. Okay. So at this point, we're going to take uh, this idea of modeling and we're going to start applying it to the extraction experiment.